Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Stollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is Peter Doherty. Peter, welcome to Comic Culture. Thank you. So you are known for your work on uh, 2000 AD and the character of Judge Dredd. I was wondering if you could I... tell us a little bit about uh, some of the, the work that you've done in Great Britain because I know American comics very well and I know very little about comics overseas. I started, it must, must have been, I don't know, 1990? So it's quite a while ago. Uh, and I actually started, you know, because 2000 AD was the only thing that seemed to be uh, approachable back then. It's similar with other people that are my age, because I'm in my early 50s now, and a lot of people started on the stuff they know. Even people who went on to work for Marvel and DC, because that's the sort of uh, area I was interested in. But I just, I wasn't a massive 2000 AD fan, actually. But there's an awful lot of people that went on to become big names in the States, you know, like Brian Bolland and Dave Gibbons, and there's a whole raft of people. And they were being, in the mid-80s, they were sort of swept up by merely DC, I think it was. And so there's a bit of a gap for new people to come in, and that's where I sort of came in. And I started by doing painted stuff as well, because um, before that, it had just merely been a black and white uh, comic which is unusual for America. And, and mostly, most of the stuff in it, uh, artistically, there were such short strips. You didn't need a team to do the artwork like you do in the States. And that's one of the things that I think uh, sold a lot of British artists because artists did the job, the whole, you know, visual job. Uh, so I just... I just found a place, and I was I was thinking, I I'd actually did try and get in, must have been, I don't know, eight, mid late 80s, and I remember taking some work down to, uh, there used to be a big convention called UCAC uh, in London in September every year for quite a few years, attracted a lot of guests, and because London's near to Europe, you know, there were quite a few European people. And I took some work down. It was fairly awful, actually. And I remember meeting Diana Schutz, and she sort of ripped it to bits, metaphorically, not literally. And I just thought, nah, I'll, I'll wait till I can do something that seems to be. I won't just keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. Uh, so I, I did a, uh, a graphics degree, actually, and did a bit of animation, did a bit of all sorts of stuff. And then, sort of after that, I knew a few people. I knew I knew Duncan Figueredo pretty well because he lived up the road from where I used to live. And John Smith, who was a, who was a writer who was quite big, even though he was a bit younger than I am. Uh, <clears throat> and he was quite big in the late 80s. He invented Devil in War, if you know that character. And so, you know, I got to know them before I actually did any samples because we, we were like a little gang there were some other people as well and john actually wrote a couple of scripts for me and um, one of his mates who he wrote with wrote i think a five-page story and john had some stuff that was it was going to go in 2000 ad but for some reason i don't think the editor wanted to publish it i can't, can't remember why uh because it's a long time ago so i did these two five-page stories and obviously that's what everybody says you've got to do, isn't it? Do some storytelling, show you can tell a story and make it interesting. And I just had these two five-page strips and I showed them to the bloke who was Steve McManus, who was in charge of 2000 AD at the time. And he, he bought one of them for one of the magazines that they were running and uh, then just gave me a job. And it was one of those things where, you know, there's lots of people who actually started drawing, especially from my age group. And when you had to go, you know, you had to get a portfolio ongoing and actually go, oh, oh, please give me a job and stuff like that. But these days, nobody does that because, you know, you don't have to go to a publisher. You don't have to go, you know, you 
publish your own stuff and publicize it online or you can you know, there's a thousand different ways of doing stuff back when i started there really wasn't i drew or painted stuff for 2000 ad mainly judge dread stuff uh, and I mainly worked with uh, John Wagner, who was the main dread writer. Uh, and, you know, I just started doing other things. And and then in must have been about mid-90s, I got I got in touch with Diana Schutz because somebody I knew knew Diana. And she offered me a Grendel thing, and I did that. And then, you know, and I ended up doing that where you sort of, like a lot of people of my age group, ended up working for DC or Vertigo, as it was then, mainly, uh, you know, because it was like, well, these are weird foreigners. We'll, we'll have to put them somewhere weird, you know. So, uh, but it, looking back, and I think even at the time, I sort of realised that the job was chopped down for me. So I was doing stuff where I wasn't colouring it anymore and I wasn't inking it because they got an inker on me who could ink properly or something. And it... I actually lost interest. That process became duller to me. Uh, so, but anyway, yeah, and, that, and and I, I ended up having a bit of a crisis of confidence, and I had, I lost some work in the late nineties, and I did all sorts of other stuff. I get, you know, I, got, I managed to land a job doing some. Uh, Design work for the for Henson's because Henson's had a uh, they they had a creature shop down in London in Camden, and I got got in there, which was sort of amazing to me because they had they must have had so many, you know, just out of the blue packages of artwork come in, but they must have seen some of the in my stuff, so I did a bit of work for them, and then you know, and then I I had a lot of little bits of things. And then I started doing colouring. Why I started doing colouring, it was just something else to do. And and it was also the beginning of doing digital colouring, which I had not done before, which was in the, uh, must have been early 2000s, something like that. You talk about working for, uh, for I guess, Jim Henson's company, uh, mm. and you're, you're working on Judge Dredd, which is, I mean, the subject of two, uh, I don't know if both of them are Hollywood films, but I mean, these are some uh, some notable properties and some notable companies that you're associated with. So I'm wondering, um, when you're working on uh, working for either of those those companies, um, what sort of restrictions are there for somebody's imagination? Is it something where you're allowed to just you know go at it, do whatever you want, or is it more limited to this is the sort of character we're looking for and you know deliver that? I think Dread was always one of those things that. It's a very, very small team that's in charge of it. They had a little bit too much to do, the editorial side. So all those questions, nobody really gave a damn about. So it's just, you know, because if you actually look at Dread stuff, the actual variety of what Dread looks like, and it's it, it's the same today. You know, I don't think... Uh, you know, because you get the feeling, or I get the feeling, and I know this from experience as well, there's editors at the bigger company like Marvel and DC who are quite anal about what you draw and you don't draw that bit and that hair doesn't go there, it goes over there, and all that sort of stuff. 2000 AD, they didn't give a crap. So long as it looked like it was supposed to look like and it looked exciting and you could tell a story, fine. So you didn't have the, all, all those things were were sort of uh, comics. Is, it, it's always been quite a you know it's it's the back basement sort of stuff, isn't it? Really, I mean, I'm sure you know that. And 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 it's so, so nobody actually gives a crap as long as it's not complete rubbish, and we've got something to publish, we're all right with that. Is there a, a difference? Um in storytelling approach, uh, like in the United States, I think the, the influence of Jack Kirby or, or a Jim Lee s seems to sort of dictate where storytelling for the next generation of artists is going to go or come from. And I'm wondering if there's, if there's sort of a, a, a school of thought that goes into storytelling uh, in Great Britain. I don't think so. I think it's, it's what people bring to it. I mean, maybe there is now, in my experiences, there never really has been because 
people I think it's one of those if you want to do comics you're probably some sort of strange sort of person anyway so all, all those things you probably pick up on your own and and I think the editors that are the gatekeepers that go yeah I'll give you a job I'll give you a try no you've got to go away they know you know they can tell whether so I think that I think people there's a like with 2000 AD there's a lot of people who grew up on it and they learn what they learn from that stuff uh, and I think you see and, and like my stuff I never think because I wasn't I didn't come up with 2000 AD particularly and I sort of grew up on we had black and white reprints of uh, Marvel comics that's what I grew up on so Jack Kirby John Basim more than anybody and yeah, people like that but I, I fairly early I I discovered because we used to go when I was little I used to go to uh, Europe on holiday and when you discover people like Mobius because they're just in the supermarkets there and so you see this stuff and it's a bit of an eye opener Oh, that's what I found. So I think there's, 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 we're at a, a strange place where if you if you deign to look, you can find all sorts of different things. And I think that was harder, you know, going back 20 years. Now it's not. You can see all sorts of rubbish, anything you want to do, and it's right on your computer screen. But I think when I was young, you didn't see that. And I remember talking to uh, Didier Crease. He came across to uh, to the Leeds Comic Convention it's a few years ago now, and I was talking to him, and he said he 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 questioned why more people from Britain didn't go work in France. Now we sort of it came down to a language thing, but he said, you know, we're like 15 miles away across a bit of water, and everybody looks to America. Uh, but obviously it's a, a coincidence of language. But also I think a lot of it's down to the fact that we grew up on that American stuff as well, you know, as well as 2000 AD. And that's, I think, in that sort of semi-superhero genre, 2000 AD is definitely in there, uh, in with Marvel and DC. And I think that's m what my generation grew up on. So... Now, is there a difference uh, in your storytelling approach if you're doing something uh, full color painting uh, versus maybe just pen and ink? Uh, are you approaching the, the visuals different? I mean, obviously, you're approaching the visuals differently, but are you approaching yeah, yeah, the yeah. storytelling elements differently because maybe it's easier uh, to convey one sense of emotion using full color and another sense of emotion using the, the starkness of black and white? Hmm. Uh yeah, I just, I don't know, I just, it's its all of a piece. Because, like I say, when I went to work and do work for DC, I was, I was finishing some of the stuff. I was finishing, my job was done when I penciled it. And I didn't really like that. I like, maybe I'm just being retentive or something. Uh, but I like to do the whole thing. Because you, you've, I think if you, if you're used to that, then it, it's difficult to let it go. Because I worked with Jeff Darrow on when he started doing Shaolin Cowboy book, and I did most of the work other than the drawing and writing that Jeff did. And he was he, he was always, because he's quite, con not controlling, but he's interested in the whole job, because he designed it and I actually just did the physical, you know, drew the logo, did all the colouring and all this sort of stuff. So. He was in charge of how the book looked, the whole thing. Uh, and he was interested in that. And he, and he always said, and, and I agree with him, he was always a bit, bit bemused by people who just wanted to do the drawing. And if they could be in charge of that aspect of the thing, the presentation and what it looked like and even down to what was on the back cover, all that sort of thing, why wouldn't you want to do that? But some people are and some people aren't, you know. And, and I, I think it's just it's just a difference of opinion. Uh, I don't think there's a right and wrong way of doing it. 
And in most situations, I suspect you can't do it, you know, because if you work for Marvel and DC or you, even if you work for a company and you own the stuff, they're still doing the job, you know, finishing it off. But I've found, because the past few years I've done, uh, I've worked with Mark Miller quite a lot on a lot of his books that have come out via Image. And I've coloured some, and, and some of them I did, did some of the design, but basically because there was nobody else to do it, and I could do it. But I, I actually quite like that, to actually sit down and go, no, I think we're going to have the, the logo's going to be this colour, and we're going to do this this way, and we'll... And, and, that, and, and it's a job to try and fit in with, you know, because a lot of this stuff, I, I work with people I knew, because I've known Mark for years, and... I was working with Frank quietly, who, I, you know, he's an old mate. And we just talk. What do you think's best? And he'd, he'd see, like, three or four versions of something that I'd put together. And, no, oh, no, I like that second one. Let's go with that. And because you're working for Image, it's on, it's on a book. Not that I owned it, but Mark did. All the stuff I worked on, it was Mark's. And I don't think he was vastly interested in that side of things. He just wanted the book to come out. If he had his name on and all the, the stuff he was interested in looked good, so long as all the other little bits didn't look that bad, that was fine. But, you know, but I was sort of in charge of it on some of the, some of them that I worked on, some I want, you know, the people did it. You said that you offer maybe three or four versions of something. Is this because you're able to uh, work digitally, it's just easier for you to do something as opposed to the old days of, let's say, you've got to do a, a color guide or maybe you're doing, you know, watercolors or, or colored ink over a, a, a you know, photocopy. Well, I think it is, yeah. It's, it, I think it frees you up to give different aspects of things and, and you know, you can just... And, and it's, it's... If it's just changing logo colors or, you know, putting a slightly different effect on, you, you know, you can play about with stuff. And I, I enjoy that. It's, it's an interesting thing. I don't know how many people are actually interested in it, but, you know, I am. So, but not that I do that much these days, because my, my role, because I'm not working for Mark anymore. My role, because I started off colouring and designing and, you know, lettering and doing basically the stuff I had done for Jeff Darrow on, on his book originally. You know, more or less any job that wasn't Jeff's, I, I got to do it. And, uh, and I was sort of doing that for Mark. And Frank sort of brought me on. We'd been talking about working together for a long time on and off. I think because Mark had previously worked with Marvel, Marvel do all that stuff, don't they? They, they put the book together. And you go to Image and they go, have you got a designer? I mean, you got somebody to do all that work. And I think Mark was a bit, why do I need somebody? And, you know, I, these days, if, if you're fairly knowledgeable uh, with computers and with Photoshop and, you know, in design and all these other, you know, that many other programs, really, you know, you can do a professional job or you've got the tools to do a professional job, whether you can do a professional job. That's another question, <laughs> but, you know, but it, it gives you the opportunity. So let's talk a little bit about the discipline, because there are so many digital tools. There are so many things that we can do and then undo and try again and try it from this approach and that approach. Do you find yourself having to say, you know, I'm going to come up with this because I need to hit a deadline and, and I need to just make sure I get it done clearly, but I don't need to fixate on trying to make it uh, the best way it can be all the time because sometimes getting it done is its own reward. If there's an anal retentive way of doing it to worry about it and lengthen the process and miss your deadline, that's probably the approach I'll take, sadly. Despite my best efforts. But, some, you know, there's a, I, I think you find that uh, because, like, like, there's certain aspects that are set in stone, you know, if you've got a, color, a, a cover that looks a certain way, you know, if it's got a certain uh, color scheme, there are only certain things that will work with it. 
and I and I tried to fit in with that and tried to to make things so they don't so it all looks of a piece so it's got some sort of sense of of being and I'm not really that that much I'm not like Ryan Hughes who's a proper designer and people who do you know proper design work but I think I'm somewhere in that gap between those people that just you know actually do do it in the way you've said because it's needed now and it's just knocked out because you see a lot of comic book covers and you just think or I do but then maybe I'm just being snobby I don't know it's you know and I, but I, I do understand that uh, a lot of the prerequisites from a company they're not the same if there's just two or three individuals involved which is in surprise is it it's just how it works you mentioned covers there are covers that do grab your attention and for me the the covers that grab the attention the most are from those artists who you know are are spending a little too much time on something they're they're more concerned with getting it just right, as you say, the anal retentive way, uh, rather than somebody who's like, well, it's a really cool pose and you know, send it out to get colored. Um, so when you're working with a, a team that has that similar mindset, if you're sort of you know, on the back end getting everything ready for whatever the deadline might be, uh, do you find yourself sometimes encouraging them to get the job done or uh, do you just kind of let it come in as it comes in? My my experience has been just to wait for everybody else to do their job and then get my job done as quick as I can, you know. Because some of the stuff I coloured for Mark, I worked on MPH that you know, my old mate Doug of Grado drew. And I didn't colour all of it. This is about, you know, half a dozen pages or so. And it sort of speeded it up by, like, three days. I don't know why. Just... And, and it... To me, because I know what my colour looks like, and I think Duncan felt the same, it looks wrong, the extra, but they're not that they're bad, they're not bad. Uh, but it just, you know, sometimes you do have to do that and get it done. And, and it, it just seems a bit pointless to me, but then I realise I'm not, yeah, I'm not a publisher and I'm not somebody who... I'd rather have something done properly than, you know, done to just get under that that wire. But you know, difference of opinion, isn't it? But it's it's a it's it's good to have that difference of opinion, I suppose, because we are able to look yeah, at sure. <laughs> we're able to look so, at, at 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 somebody's work, uh, and like you say, I can always tell when there's there's a, an anchor on a book let's say, and then there's three or four pages that maybe somebody did to fill in. You can always see a difference in the line work. Uh, and I'm uh, sure it's the same with, with lettering or with coloring. Um, so even if you're working quickly, I'm, I'm assuming that your, your goal is to have the book look right, even if you are trying to get it done, you know, three pages in an afternoon, let's say. Yeah, well, I think so. But then, you know, there's, there's, there's all those stories here, about, especially with colorists, you know, people that walk in, and I've heard them of people who've been shouted at, you know, this book needs to be in today, and an editor comes down and said, get as many people on it as you can, you know. But then, I suppose, I mean, my approach is, like, I don't think a lot of my, when I've done colouring work, don't look much like anybody else. I don't think it stands out that much, but it don't look a lot like other people. I don't render the same. That's why it takes me a bit more time. I don't do that sort of, you know, the, the flat edges and the hard edges of coloring and stuff like that, which you see in a lot of Marvel and DC comics, you know, because I, because I think that was the way... Uh, I think the knowledge was passed from a small number of people. So everybody's sort of the same. And I, I suspect there's... Everybody sort of trains similarly, but also there's a, you know, there's there's a, a an editorial need for all these things to be, you know, products that look pretty much the same. So, well, Peter, I'm I'm afraid uh, they're telling us we've run out of time. Oh, uh, right. Sorry, <laughs> I go on. 
No, it's been a great conversation. I'd like to thank you so much for taking time out of your day to, to talk That's with fine. me. I'd like to thank you at home for watching Comic Culture. We will see you again soon. He had a writer's test, which consisted of four pages of Jack Kirby artwork with no copy. My mission, should I choose to do it, was to add words to these pictures. Well, who wouldn't do that? I mean, why not? A week later was Roy, who was offering me a job with Stan Lee. Comic Culture is a production of the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke.